Hi, I'm Zach. I work for Factual, and I'm here to talk about code execution as data. Uh, we build systems which create data faster than we as humans can consume it. And to illustrate this, consider a cocktail party that goes on forever. And our view into this is that for every word that's spoken, we get a tuple that describes who said it, where they were when they said it, and when it was said. And of course, this is not a very useful view because all the conversations are just merged into one big undifferentiated stream. And so to make sense of this, we need to sort of tease it apart and figure out all the different conversational threads. But even if we do that, for every conversation that we're reading, there are a dozen other that we're not. And so we are constantly falling behind. And so the only way that we can stay on top of this, the only way that we can begin to understand this is to pull back and have a higher level understanding of what exactly is happening. And it's illustrative maybe to think about if we were to tell a story to our friends about what just happened, how would we go about that? Uh, we would not tell them every single word or every single pause or every single glance. We would only focus on the things which are relevant to the story that we're trying to tell. And ultimately, the version that we're giving of the events is sort of a more coherent, more focused version of the world. But of course, that's only one of the possible narratives that exists there. There could be a completely divergent uh, story that tells something completely different, means something completely different. And really, this is what we as programmers do to some extent. We take data that has these sorts of caveats and irrelevancies, and we carve them away, and we raise ourselves into this more abstract, more defined sort of world. Um, and this is usually useful, right? We don't need to focus about with every single sort of nuance of the processes or the data that we deal with. But it's very easy sometimes to lose sight of the fact that this is just a narrative. And we kind of begin to mistake the map for the terrain itself. So if we consider the tools that we have to do this sort of simplification, to do this sort of narrativization, um, we can filter data, right? We can focus in on a defined subset of it. We can sample the data. We can focus in on a random subset of it. We can aggregate data. We can take multiple values and reduce them down to one. And we can group the data, taking a defined category or categories, and then within each of those, doing a composition of these other operations. But for each of these, there's sort of an implicit assumption. When we filter the data, we assume that we can consider that subset in isolation. When we sample, we assume that our data is largely uniform. When we aggregate, we assume that the cardinality or the sum or the mean is a reasonable proxy for the raw values themselves. And when we group, we assume that our categories are useful or sound, that they have some sort of bearing on what's really going on. And so logging is how we understand systems, right? This is what we use. This is our tool, our sort of window into what we build. And it has some sort of qualities that uh, you know, we just kind of have learned to deal with. For one, when we log, we don't just decide that this is something that we might find useful. We also decide how to transform it and then how to present it, right? This is a, a single step from our perspective. And it's also merged into one big undifferentiated stream. And so there are some assumptions here that sort of uh, are, are embodied in how we go about this. One is that if we don't log something, we don't need it. And this means that you know, there's lots of context that's sort of available to us, and we pick and choose. And the assumption is that we'll never need anything that's not in this log file. And obviously, this isn't always true, but it is a very hard assumption for us to disprove. right? We, we don't exist in the world where there are these details available to us. And so the only real failure mode that we have, or the only real ground truth, really, is when uh, our system fails and we can't tell why from the logs. Other than that, like, we're just kind of taking it on faith that these logs are giving us a sort of meaningful representation of what's going on underneath the covers. And these logs are typically you know, fairly high level. These are things that we want to be able to tail or to look into or to kind of browse and understand what was going on. But we also want to be able to do sort of uh, after the fact batch processing, right? And so we are kind of serving two masters, which are ourselves in the moment when we're looking at the logs and ourselves a month from now when we really would like to know something a little bit different. And so 
for the one, we only want the details that matter, but for the other, we want sort of the raw material with which to construct a new narrative. And these are sort of uh, at tension with each other. These are uh, things that we have to strike a balance between. And you know, it's a difficult balance to sort of find, and often we do tend to kind of optimize for what's useful for us in the moment. So um, about three years ago, uh, as a weekend project, I wrote a web server. And uh, I didn't do very much. I took an existing Java library called Netty, which is a very stable, performant, sort of battle-scarred library uh, in Java. And um, I made it so that it could say, hello world. And the one sort of tweak there, the one thing that differentiated this from Jetty or any of the other sort of pre-existing uh, web servers is that I decoupled the request and response. Most of you are probably here for the pedestal announcement, right? And this is something that they did as well because this is a limitation of the sort of ring spec. It's not an important limitation for most people's use cases, but it is one. And I was kind of curious, what happens if you do this? What are, what are sort of the design ramifications? What you know, happens to how we deal with these sorts of things? Um, I didn't have any answers. I just thought it was an interesting question. So I, I wrote this thing and I put it out on the mailing list. And uh, because it was enclosure and it was event driven and it was a web server, like it hit that right sort of uh, balance of you know, buzz words and people kind of were really excited for you know, a day. And uh, I took that, though, as sort of an indication that there was some interest here. And like, I'd kind of uh, piqued my own interest. And I realized that this is an interesting sort of problem space to explore. And so I kind of forged on, and I started to think about sort of events from you know, uh, over the network and sort of reasoning about those as streams and like all these other sorts of things. But as I started to build things, and as I started to use these sorts of tools that I had made for myself, I realized that the streams weren't just for me to be able to define the behavior of the system. It was also for me to be able to understand the behavior of the system. It was uh, both sort of a way to specify what I wanted to happen, but also to make sure that it was happening or that like, my specification was correct or useful. And so in these sort of time since I wrote this Hello World web server, um, I've kind of built up a few uh, assumptions of my own. And the foremost of this is that the execution of code, right? The, the uh, sort of thread of execution passing through a particular function can be treated as an event. And that can be an event in a stream which has an event emitted into it every time that we pass through there. And also that while these events don't necessarily have uh, causal relationships or these other sorts of things. Often they're at least a little bit related because for all that we want to be able to say that we can reason about things in isolation, that we have these sorts of isolated contexts, there are still these sort of fixed shared resources, right? We have a fixed amount of memory. We have a fixed number of threads. We have a fixed number of file descriptors. We have a fixed amount of bandwidth. And while we don't necessarily get up against these failure modes often, we do get up against them sometimes, and then all of a sudden, this sort of clean, separated world that we live in sort of falls apart. And so we can't lose sight of that, right? And yet, it's very easy to, because we do create simplified views of the world for a living. And so we do sometimes like, find ourselves to be very comfortable in this place that we've built, and we don't really want to leave. And so we begin to kind of convince ourselves that this is how things really work. So about six months ago, I started working for a company called Factual. And Factual's business is creating indices of real world canonical entities, right? Places, businesses, products. And this is pretty hard because nothing like this exists. There is no ground truth here. All we have is a bunch of people saying stuff on the internet, on their own websites, on other websites. We have people telling us that you know, this place is open, it isn't open, and it's our job to take these sorts of ambiguous, sort of uh, conflicting inputs and to canonicalize them, to deduplicate them, to kind of disambiguate all these different opinions, and out the other side come an index which contains sort of a canonical representation of the real world, right? We have 
uh, IDs for each canonical entity. We have attributes, which are hopefully true, about each of these things. And when I came on board, they were uh, just in the middle of working on something which allowed people to submit corrections and have those be reflected in our API in real time. And the reason that this is useful is because people kind of use our API as a database. They say, so-and-so is here. What's nearby? What can you tell me about those places? And if they give us a correction, they say, oh, no, 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 this place closed down last week, then they don't want to have to kind of keep track of this uh, inconsistency in our data set until we get the next batch run through. They want to be able to have that be there the next time they come to us. And of course, it's not that easy because we can't just take their word on it. We're not Wikipedia. It's not the last edit win sort of thing. We have to consider whether or not this additional signal changes our opinion of what's so. And this is a little bit complicated. Um, kind of at a high level, we take the input and we try to understand what they're talking about, right? If someone says they want to correct something about Bob's Diner in White Plains, New York, we have to figure out what entity that actually corresponds to. Sometimes they'll give us an ID, but not always. So we have to find candidates in our index, which are similar to that. We also have to then clean it up so that it has you know, a canonical address or a canonical phone number, and then see if there's anything that resembles that. And then we take the things that resemble what they told us, and the things that resemble what we think they meant to say, and we figure out, is there some sort of clear winner here? If so, we fetch all the previous inputs we've had for that entity, we resummarize them, we see whether anything's changed, and if so, then we publish it out, both to our customers and to our API servers. And this is fairly complicated in practice. Uh, this spans multiple services, multiple runtimes, multiple uh, data stores, has multiple requests to each data store. And uh, each of uh, the sort of aggregate code is maintained by about a dozen different people. And so uh, when I came in the first day, I was told that I kind of owned this. <laughs> so my goals were to you know, do a good job to make sure that the system was stable and fast and to figure out how to make this transition from sort of batch code to real-time code, which is a little bit of a you know, uh, iffy transition. But also uh, to kind of take these assumptions that I had built up over the years, my sort of beliefs about how things should be done and to see if they held any water. And so the first thing that I did is instead of logging in line, I created a macro called trace. And trace takes two values. And one is a probe name. It is a uh, descriptor of the stream of data that this represents. And the other is the value that I want to emit into this stream. And probes are uh, sort of modeled on dtrace probes. And the sort of net effect there is that if nobody's paying attention, if nobody cares about this event, then the body won't even be evaluated. We have sort of a decoupling of the fact that there is some data that someone might want and that there is data that is going to definitely be written to, uh, to like a log file somewhere, written over the network or wherever else. And you know, so this is basically just something that we can annotate our code with. To consume this, we create a probe channel. And a channel is in a library I wrote called Lamina, sort of a generic way of thinking about streams of events. It is analogous, but in some important ways different to like the sequences that Clojure builds upon. And we can either select one of these, or we can select multiple ones by doing a wildcard or regex upon the name. And with this comes a really wide variety of <coughs> operators that we can apply to these channels. And these can be used to sort of build these narratives, right? We can filter events by either mapping over and selecting out uh, specific fields. We can filter out events. We can take or drop a certain number of events. Um, and you know, these are very familiar, and there are a fair number of other functions which are also followed by a star, which you will recognize. Um, there are other ones which are a little bit less immediately recognizable. Transitions will filter out repeated runs of a value from the stream. So you only see when things change. We can sample events. Uh, sample every will give us the most recent event that we've seen at a fixed interval. Uh, but there are sort of more complex ones. Sample will actually give you a statistically representative sample of the events and periodically emit that. Moving sample will do the same, but is more biased towards recent events. 
And in the special case where we have a, uh, numbers as the values in our stream, we can get the statistical distribution of those numbers. We can aggregate events. We can do, uh, get the mean, we can get the rate, the sum. Uh, we can also get the reductions, which is a core closure function, which I think most people don't use, but in this context it's very useful. Getting the reductions of addition across a stream of numbers will, for every event that comes in, give you the sum of all events that have come through thus far. We can also group either by time, by batching things uh, at fixed intervals, or we can do distribute aggregate, which is similar to the split apply combine mechanism that uh, is commonly used in uh, numerical analysis. And all this does is it says, I'm going to take each event that comes in, examine a facet of it, and then split against that facet. And I will do a parallel analysis of each of these things and then join it back together at the end and give a mapping of the facet value onto the analysis value. So this has some fairly nice properties. Um, one of which is that we have a very rich set of, a ri very rich vocabulary for being able to talk about these things, right? This is, again, analogous to closure seeks. We have a single core data structure and a variety of ways of interacting with that. We also have distinct streams for distinct data. Now, we have log levels, right? But this is not a, uh, a fixed thing. What is info, right? What is info to you? What is info to the guy who wrote some library that you're using? If you turn on debug, are you going to like drown in the flood of irrelevancies that suddenly show up? And so we want to be able to have the identification of a stream and the significance of a stream to be something that we can map onto our application semantics, not some sort of lowest common denominator that was dreamed up however long ago. And by decoupling the generation of the event from the consumption of the event, we allow for multiple things to consume that, so to build multiple narratives atop these things, but we also allow for no one to consume these things, to basically have this be something which is latent within our code that we may want at some point. And indeed, we can consume this dynamically while the program is running. Uh, there are a variety of ways to do this, including just having a streaming HTTP response that gives us out this data. But there are some problems too, and you know, foremost among them is that I'm talking about the fact that these events are related, right? That there are maybe causal relationships between events or sort of less obvious things. But the only way for us to take multiple streams and join them together is via this name structure, and you can be clever with that, but fundamentally uh, that embodiment of these relationships is distinct from the code itself. And if it falls, gets sort of out of date or they kind of you know, get out of sync, that is a problem. It means all of a sudden we don't really have a very accurate understanding of how things are fitting together. And while this trace macro uh, has some nice things, like the data is structured, we don't have to have a bunch of formatting right next to the code which is doing stuff, it's still noisy. It's still unrelated to what we're trying to do. It's, it's sort of meta information rather than something which is directly related to our process. And so an obvious sort of observation that we can make is that most events that we care about correspond to when a function is called or when it returns. And so if we instrument a function, this returns back to us a function that while it's being invoked, will emit events. Um, on the enter probe for this function, we get an event every single time that it is called. And so we get the name, we get the context, we get the timestamp, and we get the arguments. When the function returns, we get all the same data, but we also get the duration in nanoseconds. We get uh, the return value, and we get the subtask, which I'll talk about in just a second. We also, in the case of an error, we'll get much the same thing, except we'll get the exception instead of the return value. Uh, now, we don't necessarily want to be wrapping all of our defins in these sorts of instrumented things, and so there is a more convenient mechanism here. But what I want to point out is that, in this case, the instrumented function foo is calling into another instrumented function bar. And so if we consume the return value from this stream, we not only get the value for the one function, we get the uh, value for any other instrumented function which is called within that scope. And the reason that this is significant is because now we are able to capture one of the most meaningful sort of relationships between different things that are happening, which is they are in 
to the sort of goal of accomplishing the same task, right? These are related in that not only, you know, the time of one affects the time of the other, but, you know, these things are trying to accomplish something in concert. And so this means that now all of a sudden we can kind of look at the top level entry point for a web request and see everything else that we thought that was meaningful uh, during that web request. And, you know, the, this is sort of a choice we get to make. What is significant? Not every function, right? Not things that are called a million times just to add stuff together, but there are things that we want to very much know when they're called and how long they took. Um, but again, you know, this data structure that I showed you is fairly large, right? If we just take that and we're not very, very spare in terms of what we instrument, uh, that's going to fill up our logs pretty quickly. It's a lot of, you know, potentially irrelevant data. And so, if we choose just to focus on the amount of time that things take, right? Because time, timeliness is sort of an aspect of correctness when we're writing these sorts of systems. And often what we're trying to understand is uh, what was slow? Why was it slow? When was it slow? Um, we can focus in on just that aspect of it. And so by distilling one of these timing values, we make a small but crucial change in that the duration field turns into a durations field. And the reason that this is important is because if a function is called multiple times, it will have a distinct timestamp, it will have a distinct uh, input and output value, and if we don't care about that, we can merge them all together. And each repeated call just adds an additional field to the durations. Even more useful is the fact that we can take an arbitrary number of these things and just merge them together, right? If they all share the same common root, we can take a day's worth of requests and view them as a single object. And in fact, that is what I did. I uh, wrote something which took uh, these timing values from the logs, and I created a closure command line tool which read from standard in and read them through and continually merged this together until I had this you know, enormous object in memory, and then I analyzed it. And then I printed out the values of it. And this should look kind of familiar if you've ever used Visual VM or your kit or anything else, but you know, this has a nice property of, I've already identified what I care about. I don't have you know, seven levels of functions trying to iterate through some sequence. These are things which I, I know to be meaningful for me. And so this will tell us you know, what, where, where was the time spent. And so you have the one which denotes how much overall time it took, and the other in parentheses, which is how much time was not accounted for by the children. And it tells us a few things about it. It tells us the statistical distribution of the time that it took. In this case, this is a very cheap call, so you know, the median is two milliseconds and the uh, 95th percentile is about 12. It also tells us how often it was called. And you know, this is useful because sometimes we make more calls than we intend to. Sometimes we duplicate work or other sorts of things. And so this is, again, sort of a sanity check, another view into this. And so this is useful. This has real utility, and this you know, really helped me in trying, in, in trying to understand the characteristics of all these different moving pieces. And one of the nice things about it is that it gives me multiple views into this, right? In one level, we have sort of just the overall time. We have this sort of aggregation. But we also have this sampling, which gives me sort of the distribution, also tells me how many times it was called. These are all sort of different limited views, which together give me a much richer understanding of what actually happened. Another good thing about this is that this maintains the hierarchical relationship of these different function calls. Um, it would be very easy for me to individually uh, log each time a function was called or to forward that to something like Graphite, but then all these things are kind of being considered in isolation. And I no longer can say, for this request, this database query was made. I can say, for all requests, here are all database queries, and like try to kind of tease apart what that actually means. This gives us a very direct way of understanding how these things are fitting together, and of course, we might not always want that, but we should always go from the richest view and then sort of proceed from there. Um, a fairly bad thing about this is that it's hugely memory intensive, right? We're, we're taking everything and we're merging it together, and um, when you're getting millions of requests a day, it doesn't take very long before your laptop just kind of falls over. And um, so this is something where you can kind of mitigate it by sampling the data or focusing on a subset, but uh, this is you know, sort of bouncing up against real world limitations in terms of you know, the, the hardware that you have. The other problem is that it's sort of a static presentation, right? I mean, it's being printed out and it's you know, certainly not pretty because that wasn't really my intent when I wrote it, but um, it also is sort of locked into that representation, right? In much the same way that if you use your kid or visual VM, you're locked into their representation of the data, 
And also, this is still just a subset of what's actually going on here, right? I've, I've instrumented my closure code, but there's also sort of Java that I'm calling into and JavaScript that is calling into me, and then still further JavaScript underneath the Java, which are these sort of these specialized domain-specific rules, and I have absolutely no visibility into that. And so I can kind of reason by, you know, in broad strokes about what's going on, but it doesn't really help me help these other writers figure out what's going on in the system and how it can be improved. And so, I went around to all the different engineers who have code sort of in motion in this system, and I asked them to be able to take this sort of distilled timing data structure and to be able to, to generate that from the execution of their code. And so this involved Node.js, it involved uh, Java, it involved some Ruby, uh, and I said, um, please package it up, send it via UDP to this particular port, and like, just forget about it until I have something to tell you. And so I called the server Omphalos, which is named after the uh, stone that the Greeks believed to be the center of the world. It also happens to be the Greek word for uh, navel. And uh, what I did was maybe a little bit underwhelming uh, from first appearances because it's basically what I just showed you, but in the browser. But under the covers, this is actually pretty significant because what's happening is that uh, I'm getting these packets and I am, in real time, constructing a streaming profile of everything going on across our entire system. And because we've instrumented code, which is both run in a batch context and in a real-time context, we implicitly have the ability to do the same to any sort of MapReduce job that we need to run. And this is, for me at least, a useful presentation. I've been uh, told by other people that it's completely unreadable, but um, I found this to be useful. But of course, that's not something that people should have to be married to. And so there is, of course, a way to just get pure JSON that represents this. And we've been looking at sort of a variety of other ways to, to represent this. Uh, Tom White, who presented earlier, um, tried out this, which is sort of a radial view, where the angle represents the amount of time. And this gives us this very nice high-level view of the relationship between sort of high-level tasks and low-level tasks, and let us very quickly focus in on the things which are actually taking up a lot of time and ignore the things which are sort of irrelevant. Um, but of course, this is still only one view of this whole thing, and, of course, and we are able to analyze it in a whole other realm of ways. And one of the things that we do is uh, we have, still have this context field on each of these distilled timings, and these can contain anything. Uh, in the example that I showed, it contains the host and the uh, process ID, but we also use it to contain the, uh, the git shaw of everything that's running. We have what service it belongs to, and you know, basically anything else that we care to uh, analyze, and then when any sort of data comes in, we split it across each of these facet values. And so now we don't only have sort of a top level analysis of this, we can also say, for this particular Git shot, what's the performance characteristics? For this particular process, what are the performance characteristics? And then once we have that, once we have multiple versions of this, we can compare any one of them. So this is basically taking two of these and using a red-green sort of shading to give you the, the timing differences between these. And of course, there are multiple facets that we can compare. And it's not clear immediately which of these is the most useful, but um, you know, we can say from one version to another what changed, but also from today to yesterday what changed. Or indeed, any two samples can be compared in this way at a high level understanding what the differences are. And this is you know, far from the only type of analysis that we can do from this. These are just ideas. But these have all proven to be you know, concretely useful in trying to you know, conquer the like, varied complexities of this system. One final thing that I did was um, I realized that one of the problems that made the batch analysis, these sort of pretty print stats in the command line, memory intensive, is that I couldn't use the streaming, like sort of memory uh, cheap analyses that I had uh, for me with the real-time analysis. And so this is because I'm expecting things to come in real time, and I need that sort of temporal quality and the sort of uh, temporal wall clock quality to uh, you know, have these sorts of analyses. Um, but this is actually can be worked around, and so I created a function which can take these analyses which expect things to be coming in real time. But as long as the initial value has some sort of timestamp that I can read, um, I can apply anything that is meant to sort of consume these channels and apply it to a sequence. And this has all the nice sort of lazy, you know, 
uh, consumption on both ends, sort of quality that you would come to expect. And what it emits out the other end is not just the value, in this case the rate, but also the logical time at which it would have been emitted. And so this means that any analysis that we dream up that we'd like to have for our system in real time, we can apply retroactively to anything that we've previously captured. And so that's, you know, where we stop because that's where things were, you know, about a week ago. Um, but these are sort of just some things that I've done uh, to further my general beliefs slash assumptions slash, you know, crusade in terms of how this thing should be done. And uh, I'll say that, you know, in general, we should always mind our assumptions. We should always understand what the limitations of our worldview is when we're trying to analyze these things. We should always designed with sort of the transparency and introspection as a first-class concern in the systems that we build, right? It's harder to make something which is not opaque, but it's worth it. And finally, we should always allow for further composition, further narratives to be built atop these things. We should never uh, ground ourselves out in some sort of thing where all of a sudden this data is unavailable to us. And what I've presented to you is, you know, one way to accomplish this, but by no means the only way to accomplish this. And you know, I'm really interested to see what people do and, you know, maybe have people tell me what they have been doing in this same field. And if you are interested in, you know, kind of exploring some of the things that I've built, um, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that. So um, with that, I'll leave the floor open for questions.